Hi, my name is Leonardo Frid, and I'm going to be speaking about a project we're working on in collaboration with Matt Reeves to develop a quantitative state and transition simulation model based on a conceptual model from an ecological site description. This project is part of a larger project that's being led by Matt to develop a rangeland vegetation simulator. The objectives of the work were to demonstrate how a conceptual model from an ecological site description could be used to develop a quantitative model. And the focus of the quantitative model is to look at questions around uh, management actions pertaining to fire, grazing, and herbicide application with respect to invasive plants. Now, I want to caveat the presentation with the fact that this, this is a prototype model. So at this stage, the focus is on the approach that we took rather than on specific values uh, we use for model parameters or on the model predictions themselves. The conceptual model that we worked with was for upland gravelly loam, Wyoming big sagebrush from Utah. And there's a reference on the bottom left for the publication for where this model was first published. State and transition simulation models begin with a conceptual model. And just to clarify uh, terminology, because I know many uh, people in the audience will be familiar with uh, ecological site description state and transition models. The sim in the simulation models, the term state refers to what in the conceptual models would be, would be the equivalent of a phase. And each vegetation state uh, really represents, or the suite of vegetation states represents uh, the possible vegetation communities which could occur at any one location on the landscape. So here I have a very simplified uh, mock-up of a state and transition model where we have three possible vegetation states, a shrubland, a forest, and an invaded state. And the arrows represent the transitions that can move any one parcel of land between these states. So succession moves shrubland to forest, fire, forest to shrubland, invasion, shrubland to invaded, and restoration moves invaded to shrubland. So note that these kinds of transitions can be either anthropogenic or natural processes. Now the technical term for the state and transition simulation models that's sometimes used is discrete, non-stationary Markov chain models. And these models can either be non-spatially, non-spatial, that is, they simulate the amount of land in each vegetation state over time, but they don't produce a map. Or they can be spatially explicit, and they can begin with a map and produce predictions that are map-based, as well as incorporate processes where individual parcels of land interact with their neighbors. There's a couple of good references to these modeling approaches on the left. At the bottom, Baker is a review of uh, various approaches to landscape modeling, including state and transition simulation models. And Daniel and Frid is a review of uh, appro approaches to use state and transition simulation models for modeling vegetation change on landscapes. In the next few slides, I'm going to show um, the kinds of inputs that are required to be able to run state and transition simulation models and describe a little bit how these models work. So to begin with, um, you need to take a landscape that you want to make predictions for and uh, divide it up into what we call simulation cells. And those cells can either be gridded, as shown in the upper right of this slide, or they can be irregularly shaped polygons, as shown in the center. And for the example, I'm going to be using the grid on the upper right. So this is a landscape with 64 uh, simulation cells. And we need to define what are the possible states that any of those cells might be in at a certain point in time. And again, I'm going to use a very, very simple example uh, that has three possible states, a shrubland, a forest, and an invaded state. And before we run the simulations, we need to conduct a vegetation inventory of the landscape and assign each cell on the landscape to one of the possible states as well as uh, an age of the cell, in other words, how long has that particular cell been in, been in that state. And that's summarized on the right for this uh, hypothetical 64 hectare landscape. 
after the states have been defined, uh, we then define the transitions that can move any one of these cells from one state to another. And again, I've gone over these transitions earlier in the introduction. The next step, uh, which is where we begin to uh, differ from the purely conceptual models, is that we need to assign rates for the transitions between states. And so how, how often and how quickly do they happen over time? And there's different kinds of approaches to defining rates for these transitions. So in this example, succession is a deterministic process that happens with the passage of time. And as soon as a particular cell uh, reaches an age of five, it transitions from a shrubland to a forest. Fire and invasion are probabilistic processes. So they have a specified probability of occurring at any one point in time during the simulation. And restoration is a management transition, which is assigned a target or a budget. And again, this is a small landscape, so in this example, we've assigned a two hectare per year budget. Or in other words, two cells can be restored from invaded to shrubland per year in the simulation. So in the next few slides, I'll show you how the simulation algorithm works. So here is our starting condition for the landscape. And we're going to look at the kinds of transitions that can occur for cells that are in a given state. In this case, it's forest, which can be affected by fire. And there's a 10% probability that any one of these cells might transition from forest to shrubland because of a fire. So in this case, three cells transitioned. And uh, they, in turn, get set to being set, uh, in the shrubland state now at age zero. And we do the same for all the other possible uh, transitions. And so here we have a summary of cells that were either burned from forest to shrubland on the right. At the top left here, cells that were shrubland but became old enough to become forest. And uh, we have cells that were restored from invaded to shrubland and cells that were in shrubland and became invaded. And we can summarize uh, the state of the landscape after that initial time step, and the number of cells in each state has now changed. If we repeat that forward in time for several time steps, then we can project how the landscape changes over time. And then we can repeat that for various iterations, where each um, iteration is a Monte Carlo simulation. And we can then make predictions both about the expected average, uh, but also the range of variability around that expectation or the uncertainty um, around the model predictions. One thing to note is that uh, the transition probabilities in the model do not have to be static, so they can vary over time. And um, we all know that, for example, fire probabilities are not the same every year. Some years are hotter and drier than other years. And so um, the model is sophisticated enough to be able to capture these kinds of processes. The models can also be spatially explicit. So even though I showed you a map in this example, the cells in the example that I showed you did not interact with each other. Using a spatially explicit model, the, cell, the cells can interact. So for example, for a fire event, rather than having three independent cells independently burning, you can have a fire event initiating and then spreading from one cell to its neighbors. Spatially explicit models are useful because they allow us to evaluate spatial indicators, such as how fragmented the habitat of a particular species of interest might be. And they also allow us to consider uh, scenarios where spatial processes are important, such as implementing fuel breaks or looking at how invasive plants might spread across a landscape or looking at how uh, grazing probabilities might be affected by pro proximity to water. <clears throat> so that's an overview of how the models work. Uh, we work with uh, software tools that have been specifically developed by us to work with state and transition simulation models. And, and these tools, the latest of these tools is STSIM, which is part of a lineage of tools which be, we began in um, the early 1990s with VDDT and later became PATH, and now it's called SD-SIM. 
and the work has been funded by uh, various uh, land management agencies and there are, are a large number of users who are using these tools to look at alternative management scenarios. Now I'm going to jump to a direct demonstration of the software and again we're working with a conceptual model for upland gravelly loam in Wyoming Big Sagebrush in Utah. I'm not going to get into great detail about the ecology just because of the time limitation on the presentation, uh, but hopefully you'll get a sense just from uh, my demonstration of the model of the kinds of inputs and outputs and questions that you can look at with these kinds of tools. So here I'm showing on the left uh, the model in the software, and I'll quickly uh, just show, tell you which uh, states and phases we brought over from the conceptual model. So on the right, the conceptual model has six different states, uh, a reference state which represents the pre-European colonization um, landscape, a current potential state which is very similar to that but includes some uh, exotic species at low densities, and then three undesirable states, um, invaded with Utah juniper, invaded with broom snakeweed, and invaded with other invasive plants such as annual grasses and exotic forbs. And then an intermediate restoration state which takes these undesirable states through seeding and uh, herbicide application and it gets to uh, a seeded range state with species like crested wheatgrass. So those same... Um, now in, in the simulation model we excluded the reference state because it's not really necessary for looking at contemporary management scenarios. But here again we've got three boxes representing the current potential state, the three undesirable states with two phases each, and then the seeded range state at the bottom. I'm going to expand this window now so we can see um, the full version of the software. So this uh, pathway diagram includes a lot of information about the kinds of processes that can transition a parcel of land from one state or phase to another. And I can uh, filter for those transitions. So we've included processes in this example. We wanted to focus on the effects of fire, grazing, and uh, herbicide application. So here's a list of the processes we, we have included. And you can, for example, filter and try to see if uh, what are the kinds of transitions that are caused by uh, something like grazing, so normal grazing or overgrazing by cattle. And so here's a fil the transitions that are just filtered for the transitions that can happen because of these processes. I'm just going to remove the filter. Now we can also uh, find out more about these transitions by opening up one of these states. At the top, we have the deterministic transitions listed. So we can see that there's a deterministic transition to this state at age 60, and there's no maximum age. There's therefore no deterministic transitions leaving this state. And at the bottom, we have the probabilistic transitions listed. I'm going to sort them by transition type. So we can see, for example, that a high severity fire has two possible outcomes. We can either transition from the Wyoming Big Sagebrush Late Successional State, which is the one that we're looking at, to the Grass Forb Early Successional State, or if the fire is severe enough and there is a propagule bank for invasive species, we can actually transition to the invasive plant state. And here we have uh, probabilities listed for these transitions and proportions. Again, this is a hypothetical example. We're, we're focusing on the process, so don't focus too much on the details of the probabilities, but this is where you would need uh, more local expert knowledge for this particular landscape to be able to include uh, better estimates of the probabilities. There's a lot more detail that can be added to the model. For example, you see there's a large number of pathways that are possible for herbivory, and the model allows you to um, specify how the outcome of herbiv herbivory changes depending on what the past grazing history has been for a particular parcel of land. And I'm not going to get into those details right now because of time limitation. So that is uh, the pathway diagram. Now I also talked about the other input that's uh, needed to be able to run a simulation. 
is the inclusion of what the current inventory is for the landscape. And again, for this hypothetical landscape, um, we decided on using 1,000 acres. Um, if you were working with a real study area, that value would be different, of course, and would correspond to the total area of the study area you're working with. Uh, and we're using a thousand simulation cells, so that represents that each simulation cell is one acre in size. Now down below we have our hypothetical inventory for this landscape, where 50% of it is in the mid-successional stage for the current potential state, 5% is in the late successional state, and 45% uh, is in the grass forb early successional phase, and there's no undesirable states at the beginning of the simulation. And finally, to be able to run the model, uh, we define how many time steps and how many iterations we want to use. So this is a no grazing, no management scenario. So there's no restoration activities happening, and the grazing transitions have been turned off. Um, and this simulation takes a few minutes to run. I'm not going to run it for the sake of time, but we've already done it, and we can look at results for this scenario. So for example, we can see how the amount of area in each vegetation phase is changing over time. So at the bottom we have time or years on the, on the x-axis and at the top we have area and acres and these three on the left represent the current potential, mid-successional, late-successional and early-successional phases. And then on the right we see how, for example, the amount of area where we have juniper invasion is increasing uh, the amount of area where we have invasive plants is increasing uh, and the invasive plant monoculture as well is increasing over time. The other kinds of transitions that we can look at is uh, how much of the transitions themselves are happening over time. So here we have a graph showing the amount of fire over time and we see that's varying over time as fire might, and we also see the amount of in tree encroachment that's happening over time as well. And it's very low numbers in this example, um, less than three acres in any one time step. Now, so far we've just run a scenario where there's no grazing and no management, but we might be interested in looking at what if we add uh, grazing to this landscape, what if we add uh, restoration activities to this landscape. So. There's a couple of additional inputs that are required to be able to do this. One of those inputs is to define uh, what happens uh, in terms of the cost of restoration activities. And here we've defined different kinds of restoration activities such as herbicide and seed with 2,4-D, herbicide and seed with glyphosate and prescribed fire. And we've assigned per acre costs of $200 to $400 per acre for these activities. We've also defined the number of AUMs that are represented for, by a particular grazing transition. So, for example, normal grazing for one acre is represented by 0.6 AUMs, whereas overgrazing is represented by 1.2 AUMs per year. And we can assign targets to these values, so we can tell the model in this example uh, that we're interested in looking at uh, a scenario where there's 50 AUMs applied to the landscape per year and where there's a restoration budget of $1,000 per year. So now I'm going to show you results for those uh, scenarios. Um, so we can look at uh, a scenario in where there's a restoration budget of $1,000 and 50 AUMs, a scenario in where there's 50 AUMs but no restoration budget, and a third scenario in which there's 200 AUMs and a restoration budget of $1,000 per acre. So I'm going to add these to the result. And we still have the no grazing, no management as a reference. So now, because we have more activities happening on the landscape, there's more phases possible. And so again, each panel represents the amount of area in a vegetation phase over time. Uh, and the different colors represent the different scenarios now. The blue is no management, the green is 50 AUMs and a thousand dollar budget restoration, the red is 50 AUMs and no restoration, and the yellow is 200 AUMs and a thousand dollar budget for restoration. And you can see uh, that as you increase the AUMs, you see an increase in some of these undesirable states. For example, 
we have we see an increase uh, of the amount of broom snakeweed. And if we have 200 AUMs, we see a very large increase, uh, as opposed to 50 AUMs, the green and the red, where there's less of an increase. And we see that restoration can make a difference. So uh, having a $1,000 budget of restoration reduces the, um, the amount of broom snakeweed that you would see. You also see that when in the green and the yellow scenario where restoration is being implemented, that we start to see some of the seeded range state that is the outcome of the restoration activities. And again, we can show a result, uh, a, re, a similar graphic for the amount of area undergoing transitions over time. Um, and so we see, because the budget is very low, there's not very much prescribed fire happening. But there is um, <coughs> some herbicide and seeding happening in, under both scenarios uh, using either 2,4-D or uh, herbicide and seed with glyphosate as well. And here we see how much cattle grazing is happening at the top with the 200 AUM scenario and at the bottom with the um, 50 AUM scenario. That's as much as I want to show at this moment with the software. I'm just going to jump back to the presentation for one last slide. So to summarize, uh, we took a conceptual ecological site description state and transition model and converted it um, through a process into a quantitative state and transition simulation model to demonstrate uh, an example of how these models could be used to show, to look at alternative management scenarios for fire grazing and herbicide application. Now we had to make a number of assumptions because we don't have the local expertise for this particular landscape and uh, we were just creating a prototype model. So in the future, you would need to incorporate expert review to be able to refine the probability values that are being used in the model. And uh, these models really lend themselves work well um, to workshop approaches where you can work in a workshop with local ecological experts to create a more robust uh, model that represents that particular landscape. And I think a, a valuable next step would also be to look at taking the model and applying it to additional ecological sites. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening.